Dr. Vanderkock and his, and his various collaborators have published extensively on the impact of trauma on development, such as dissociative problems, borderline personality and self-mutilation, cognitive development and traumatized children and adults, and the psychobiology of trauma. He was co-principal investigator of the DSM-5 field trials for post, four, sorry, field trials for post-traumatic stress disorder. His current research is on how trauma affects memory processes and brain imaging studies of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. He is past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, professor, professor of psychiatry at Boston University Medical School, and the medical director of the trauma center at um, JRI, the trauma center in Brookline here in Massachusetts. He's taught at universities and hospitals across the U.S. and around the world, including Europe, Africa, Russia, Australia, Israel, and China. His latest book, co-edited with Alexander McFarland and Lars Weisseff, explores what we have learned in the past 20 years of the rediscovery of the role of trauma in psychiatric illness. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Finbar, and, and again, uh, thank you all for coming, and some of the images are graphic for those of you who might have come in after I men mentioned this. So uh, <laughs> be prepared, and if it's disturbing to you, you might want to take leave. Okay, when I was about 12, I went to visit my maternal grandfather. And he lived in Wales. His name was Ivor Bradshaw. And as usual, he was sitting in his armchair, watching TV and smoking. His fingers were tobacco stained and the ceiling above him was yellow from all the cigarette smoke. As long as I'd known him, he'd been a farmer and a milkman. But he also had a smudge tattoo on his forearm. It had gone green with age. Uh, there was a woman's name on the tattoo, but it was not my grandmother's name. <laughs> so I asked him about this tattoo. He took a long pull on his cigarette and then he started to tell me about his experience serving during World War II. He'd been deployed to India and then to Libya in advance of a, uh, an Allied beach landing into, uh, into Italy. He talked about that, that beach landing and how they were supposed to have air cover, but as he put it, we had air cover, but it was from the Germans. <laughs> he told me about the noise, the smell, the heat, the dust, the thirst and the fear that he experienced landing on that beach, and how the guy next to him was hit, lost his arm, and how others were killed. A couple of weeks ago, while I was preparing for another presentation as part of my Neiman Fellowship here, I went through some family archives and discovered this photograph of him. He's there on the right, again, smoking one of his cigarettes. And um, this picture, I'm almost certain, was uh, taken in North Africa. <coughs> and uh, one of the other pictures I discovered was this one, which it must have been taken somewhere in Libya before their uh, invasion into Italy, because he was based in, first in Tripoli and then in Tobruk. And when I saw this, it was the first time I'd discovered it. I'd never seen it um, until a few weeks ago. And it made me think about pictures that I'd taken last year while covering the fall of Gaddafi in Libya. And I went through my archive and discovered this image. And the similarity struck me between the two. And I started to think about this, this continuity loop and about how over 70 years and three generations, I'd pretty much ended up in the same place covering yet another seismic shift in history. Now, while I was there covering this story. Um, I was also shooting some footage for this documentary film that I was working on called uh, Under Fire about the psychological costs of covering conflict. So what I thought, I'd, rather than show you the trailer of that film, I thought I would just show you a little clip of footage um, from what a typical day was like uh, as, we, as we went up and down the road with the rebels uh, who would advance until they came under fire from Gaddafi's troops. And this is one of those moments. It runs about uh, three or four minutes. But it'll just give you a sense of, of what the working conditions were like on a daily basis.
using two cameras, that's why this one I'm switching cameras, that's why they're So basically the rebels were, this is the furthermost point, and the, there were no more vehicles now between us and Gaddafi's troops, except for this one coming back on the road. So if we missed this car, we'd be left in the desert. who were moving up and down the front line uh, in the Libyan conflict. That was one occasion. I mean, you'd have that kind of stuff going on three, four times a day. Um, uh, and that's just the typical working conditions for, for the journalists who are covering that conflict. Um, but most of my work has been uh, done in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly in Congo, um, where I spent two years living and working, uh, documenting the war there. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with the situation in Congo, it's, it's a conflict that's been running since the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. And it's the deadliest conflict since World War II. About five million people have been killed, um, or well, have died. Most of them from lack of access to, to basic health care and, and a total collapse of infrastructure due to the conflict that's involved at times nine different countries. And my job was to, to travel out and to, to photograph and report on the various uh, warring sides who were competing for control over uh, the many vast land resources, um, such as gold and diamonds and timber. And as usual, it's the civilian population that gets caught in the middle of, of these warring militias. And uh, even the government troops are, are some of the, um, the worst perpetrators of violence against the population. So violence and, and death and suffering are, are pretty, are you know, common occurrences and, and the kinds of things that we see daily in our reporting. This guy here, Jean Claude Benda, had had been shot uh, two days before by a rebel group that came into town and wanted to make sure that any fighting age males uh, would would be unable to be combatants, and so they either killed them or shot them in the leg. I visited him again two years later, and uh, he had once been a productive farmer, and now he could no longer provide for his family. A lot of people displaced uh, in refugee camps and uh, and living you know from from meal to meal. I went back again last uh, 
last November to cover presidential elections, and there hasn't been much improvement in the 10 years that I've been covering Congo. Um, presidential Guard opened fire on unarmed protesters, <coughs> and uh, you know the, tip of the, the results were predictable, bloody and, uh, and violent. So I set out in journalism to, to live raw experiences and to, to tell stories and, and live an interesting life on, on the edge of history. But at some point, this sort of great adventure that, that you set out on becomes something else. It becomes, it becomes your life and, and other people's deaths. And there's an emotional recoil to, to reckon with. And a few re years ago, I realized that I was carrying with me um, the weight of my experiences. I was, it was getting harder and harder to return to normal life after each war zone assignment. Um, and so I kept going back, and it seemed to make sense to me. The heat and the noise and the burning thirst and the fear, those things that my grandfather had told me about when I was 12 years old, those things have become part of my life. I was used to them. In 2010, I went to Afghanistan again, and I met up with uh, Sergeant Thomas Brennan. Uh, he's a US Marine Corps sergeant. And we spent uh, several, well, about a month, a little over a month together um, on the first uh, trip that I went to see him. And during that time, uh, we did many patrols. There was a lot of combat. And uh, I'm going to let him tell a bit of the story of our time together uh, on occasion when he got blown up and wounded. Back and I saw the war head was coming straight towards uh, Chun and I. I told Chun to get down. Uh, we both hit the deck. Um, I don't remember the boom. All I remember is after the smoke had cleared, I saw Steph on his elbows running towards us, screaming my name. My name is uh, Thomas Brennan. Um, I'm a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. I'm with 1st Town 8 Marines Alpha Company, and I'm a squad leader for 3rd Platoon Force Squad. The objective was to push up. Approximately 4,000 meters to the target building to potentially ambush the Taliban. We left Obi Kunja at about 1,300. We pushed down into the city in the book. Once we got down there, we probably patrolled in about 400 or 500 meters, and that's when we started taking pretty heavy volumes of fire. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting cold. 
we got the solar showers pretty much that we rely on baby wipes and clean socks. I showered once at Coon Jack in the month I was there just because the water was too damn cold. Baby wipes get the job done. And I got cots, just whatever our family sent us. I miss my wife and daughter. My wife sends me photos of my daughter. Huh. She's just growing up, she's so smart without me being there. It's kind of scary leaving when she's two and getting home when she's almost three. You, you miss so much. Being afraid of where you're walking each day, that definitely takes a toll on you. The psychological aspect is tremendous. The placement of IEDs, they know exactly where you're going to take cover when they start shooting, so they put them there. Uh, so you have to be careful where you run to once you start getting shot at. They've got IEDs on the corners, they've got IEDs on the middle of the roads. And they're only going to strike you in ambush if it's advantageous to them. And you're just going to trust your eyes and trust your super in front of the table. But one thing I always tell my guys is if, if today's the day, today's the day. I mean, if we do everything we can, there's only so much you can do. The mission can't stop because you're nervous. If you can't put one foot in front of the other, you just keep coming. Because if you don't, you stand still. That makes it easy. Yeah. <laughs> you can walk up and talk to the local national, and he seems like a straight up guy. But then two days later, you can be detaining him because he was shooting at you. Where they don't wear uniforms, you can't tell the guys with the bad guys until you catch him in the field. That's got to be the most frustrating thing about it. Before, we couldn't make it 100 meters in the city without getting shot at. Uh, now, we can make it five, six, seven hundred meters in the city before we get shot at. So, we know we're pushing it back. And I noticed when we were on patrol that more people were starting to come back. I mean, it is a slow process, you know, every 500 meters you're pushing back, you know, that allows 100 meters worth of students to come back into the city. But if we can get them back to their homes, then, then we can really start trying to make a difference by telling them, like, listen, we, you know, we push the Taliban back, you're back in your home, we're keeping you safe, and then you know, help us out. The biggest accomplishments to myself are that we found the IEDs that they put out there, of course. Nobody's been killed yet, it's going to this way. And but we've also killed Taliban. So, in my opinion, on the squad level, that's one to win. Bigger picture is a, a lot bigger than I am. I know I'm a piece of the puzzle. You know, you know, we're not doing our job, but the rest of the puzzle can't fit together. My guys have to trust me. I have to trust my leaders. If I trust them and accomplish the mission, I'm done. And then the bigger picture will find a place. Sorry about the volume on that. Um, I hope you could hear most of what he had to say. Uh, so Sergeant Brennan uh, finished his deployment last year and came back to the U.S. Um, but because of the traumatic brain injury he suffered there and his experiences uh, both in Afghanistan and in Fallujah in Iraq in 2004, he's, he's suffered quite heavily from PTSD. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that um, from here. Um, but one of the things that he's done as part of his therapy is he started writing and I've been working with him writing. Um, and he's, he's found it actually incredibly useful. And a lot of his stories are now being published in, uh, in the New York Times. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about how that can work as a, as a form of therapy as well. Um, and as he puts it, he's, he's traded a gun for a pen. Um, but uh, just, just to go back to Libya and some of the, these, to give you an example, of, uh, from that footage that I was shooting, I had a little uh, video camera mounted on my actual camera lens. So the, these are a couple of the images that were shot during that sequence uh, that you saw at the top of the, yeah. And just after I stopped the film, the, we drove past this uh, bottleneck of vehicles that uh, very shortly afterwards came under bombardment from, from Gaddafi uh, mortars. Um, and these were again the kinds of scenes that, that journalists uh, and anybody who was on the front line in Libya was exposed to on a, on a constant basis. Um, this is actually the aftermath of a NATO bombing on Gaddafi, so that's a Gaddafi soldier um, trapped in the point of no one's left of him trapped there. Um, and these were the kinds of scenes that, that were unfolding as you're covering the stuff. This was a uh, not an unusual event. I, I drove over a, a rise in the road uh, right at the front of the, uh, the front line and, and this car in front of us had just come uh, under fire and this, this uh, rebel soldier has been shot up so we had to put him in the back of the, the vehicle uh, and take him back to, the, to get a first aid um, from somebody. I don't know whether he lived or not. 
Um, but th this level of violence was, was just kind of constant, and I, I decided while I was there that I was going to take a step back and, and look at the broader context um, of, of what was happening. So in addition to the new stuff and the violent pictures, I, I, I decided to do a series of, of just what, what the war was um, about and where it was happening and why. So I just, I just photographed the road, this sort of emptiness of, of the road and, and the destruction that was being left along it. And uh, this was just the axis that the rebels were traveling up and down. And the, the key point was a, an oil refinery. And at, at one point, it looked like the, the war might split the country in two. So of course, both sides, the rebels and Gaddafi's, wanted to make sure that they controlled the oil refinery. But the idea of this was to sort of offer, uh, we were getting so many violent images from, from the Arab Spring, and I just wanted a, a little bit of a, a different take on things. While I was also there, um, I took uh, these photos of a friend of mine, uh, Tim Hetherington, uh, a photographer and journalist who produced a, an incredible film on the war in Afghanistan called uh, Rest Um the night or two after this picture was taken, we sat up in his uh, hotel room drinking uh, a bottle of whiskey and talking about uh, what it was like working on the front lines under the kinds of conditions that you've seen in that video clip. And we both decided it was just too dangerous. Uh, the kinds of images that we were getting were not good enough for the risks. And we decided we were both going to leave. And we planned to meet up a few weeks later in Ivory Coast. I left, he left. and. Uh, he decided to go back. I sent him an email saying, hey, I'm on my way to Ivory Coast, see you there. And he wrote back saying, actually, I'm, I'm heading back to, uh, to Libya. I have an idea that I want to I wanna execute. And 18 days after this photo was taken, Tim and another friend, uh, Chris Hondros, were killed by the same grenade in Nasrata. And that kind of did it for me. You know, I'd been covering conflict for a while, um, and the, this, this feeling of, of carrying it around was was getting to be a little bit too much. And the fallout from the deaths of both Tim and Chris, as well as other friends and colleagues who have died uh, since then in Syria, made me really think, rethink what I was doing and why. Um, the, the pleasure that I, that I felt in making photographs uh, sort of seemed to slip away. Um, and as I watched this sort of ripple effect of, of pain tearing through our community of conflict uh, journalists, I realized that what we're doing is actually quite selfish uh, in a way. Um, it's one thing for me to decide to, to go out and put myself uh, in danger, but my friends and family don't make that decision. Um, and those are the ones who'd have to live with the, the consequences, um, not me. Um, the other day I was reading a book um, by Ernie Pyle, the great American World War II correspondent. And in 1994, he wrote to his wife after the death of a, a fellow journalist. Um, and he was used to lo losing friends. Um, but uh, but this the death of this friend in particular shook him, and when I read it, it, it really resonated um, deeply with me. So I'm just going to read that to you before we head over to uh, the next part of the presentation. This is what he wrote to his wife. <coughs> what a waste of intelligence and character. The whole thing is getting pretty badly under my skin. I've got so I brood about it, about the whole thing, I mean. I have a personal reluctance to die that is always in my mind, like a weight. Instead of growing stronger and hard as good veterans do, I've become weaker and more frightened. I'm all right when I'm actually at the front, but it's when I pull back and start visualiz visualizing that, that it almost overwhelms me. I've even got so I don't sleep well and have half-awake hideous dreams about the war. Ernie Pyle was killed by a Japanese machine gun gunner's bullet in Okinawa on April 17th, 1945. Thanks. I don't know whether to clap or what. <laughs> 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 I'm that on, on behalf of all of us, I, I feel quite certain I can say this. I want to thank you for taking all those personal risks in order to bring these images to us. Uh, we would otherwise never see them. So, on behalf of us all, thank you. And now we have Bessel. The vessel's going to give us, give us meaning. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> we can turn But you off. need your computer, right? Yes.
Yeah, oh, just okay. trying to see that. I think I've not chosen it. Oh, wow. I haven't got much prepared because you know, I'm not going to show you this. Um, because I didn't quite know what was going to be awaiting us. But the first thing that comes to mind <coughs> is, as I hear this, is my very first experience with veterans. Uh, 1978, I started to work for the VA. And met a group of Vietnam veterans, and they came into the, into the room. And the first thing they said, we don't want to talk about it. Just like, I don't really want to talk after seeing this presentation. And I think that most of us really don't want to talk because it's just too horrendous. And then later on we did a piece of research that shows actually that when you see these images, Broca's area, the speech part of your brain actually shuts down. So it's virtually impossible for people to give voice to these experiences. And it's really the images that linger rather than the words. And the, the tension between words and images has always been central in my work in in traumatized people, in that the pictures are always so much more poignant than words because words almost can never capture it. And also people who have been traumatized become so speechless. Um, they really struck with speechless theory. And so I'm sitting in this group of Vietnam veterans and they just sit there and they all say, I don't want to talk about the war. And this happened for the first session and halfway through the second meeting, one of them says, I want to talk about the helicopter crash. He starts talking and he comes to life. He becomes very intense. And everybody else also becomes very intense. And then a certain energy comes up. And um, the group becomes very energized. And people walk out with their arms around each other. And there's this new energy in the room as people access the trauma. And so my colleague Mark Greenberg and I, who are sitting in this group, Say, this is amazing how these guys move from being numbed out, feeling nothing, into being incredibly energized as they start talking about their trauma. And that becomes one of the first things that really puzzles me, amazes me about trauma, is that at the same time that it's horrifying, it becomes energizing. And of course, as the general public watches movies like this in the movie theaters in the evening, with a lot of violence, a lot of horrible stuff, we get excited by it and we get horrified at the same time. And what always strikes me about pictures like this is, maybe you've been struck by it also, is how little impact they have. Like you see pictures like this and you say, we can never do this again and people should stop it. And yet, after the bombing of the World Trade Center, Bush says, let's go invade a country that has nothing to do with the World Trade Center. And everybody goes, rah, 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 let's do it. And there is no attention being paid to the fact that we killed 100,000 Iraqis with nothing to do with the war. And that these pictures are seen, but they're not being processed. And that makes this work so, so painful, in that people, at the same time that they're horrified, also are tremendously energized by these horrendous images. And if a politician wants to rile people up, they say, just let's go kill people, let's get excited about it. So these two things live side by side. And so intrigued with that, um, I did a lot of looking into that research, what people had said about it, and at some point I came across an old work one, one uh, paper in the Lancet of 1917 by a surgeon by the name of Beecher, who said that guys who get wounded in the trenches <coughs> don't feel any pain. And I thought that's interesting. Maybe there's something about um, how people react to trauma that causes them to secrete chemicals it makes them not register what goes on in some ways. And we did an experiment and we took a bunch of very traumatized Vietnam veterans and showed them a movie clip of Platoon before it was released. So the producers gave us a little clip before it came into the theaters. 
And we played a movie to, for these Vietnam veterans <coughs> and measured their brain chemicals. And it turned out that uh, they secreted the equivalent of 10 milligrams of morphine in response to seeing this very traumatizing movie. I say 10 milligrams of morphine is about what you get when you have a heart attack and go to the emergency <coughs> room to take away your chest pain. So it's a very substantial amount. And so we, we did this thing that showed that as people get exposed to the trauma, they also they feel the horror, but their body also secretes substances that make them feel calm, in control, and positive. And that was really the opening to our understanding how the impact of trauma is, has nothing to do with reason, it has nothing to do with understanding, it has to do with very primitive mechanisms in the brain that have to do with survival and uh, just making it, uh, making it under extreme circumstances. And so uh, we did some experiments. And um, let me just show you a few things. One of the things that is an interesting picture. So Charles Darwin writes a book in 1872, using the latest technology of his day, photography, just like photography today. Um, and he puts all these pictures together of people and animals, and he says, all animals and people have the same defenses. All of this stuff is sitting in a <coughs> very primitive animal survival brain. And he says, animals and people both get stuck in fight and flight. Fight and flight is normal, this helps us to survive. But if you get the illness of trauma, you get stuck in fight or flight. And when you're stuck in fight or flight, something happens to you. And I think Darwin put it much better than anybody I know has put it since that time. He says, if you get stuck in fight or flight, you put, it puts you in a disadvantage. In that, and in that way, Darwin had the same ideology as the Catholic Church. The function of human beings is to procreate. And if you st get stuck in fight or flight, it gets in the way of successful species preservation, because in order to have kids and to live in society, if you get stuck in fight or flight, you can no longer um, involve, if you involve in tender feelings, mating, um, gentleness, nurturance, waking up in the middle of the night, because you get stuck into startle and in numbing and fighting. And so you cannot really take care of the young. And that, to my mind, is the thing that keeps getting left out when we talk about trauma, because it, it affects the first generation, but it affects the second generation. And when you talk about your uncle watching television, smoking and doing nothing, that's how, it's, how it affects people, because they no longer have, have, are able to engage in life. So the big issue with trauma is not so much what happened in the past, but the big issue with trauma is what makes people, what, how it interferes with people living in the present, and how it gets in the way of people being fully alive from here and now. And so, what the research over the past 20, 30 years has so, so shown is that once people, once people are involved in great danger, they keep increasing their stress hormones. And the stress hormones are very nice to help you to cope and to fight and to be very alive and to be very alert and to do amazing things. But over time, as your brain keeps getting bombarded with stress hormones, you have a thing called down regulation. So you, you screw yourself down in order to cope with this onslaught of stress hormones. And before too long, if the danger, when the danger passes, you no longer feel anything because everything in your brain has calmed down. You feel numb. And you don't feel anything. A little bit like maybe some of us felt right after watching the previous presentation. You just sit there numbed out. And psychologically you feel you cannot do anything. But biologically, everything in your brain gets down-regulated. And so you go through life not feeling much. And the next thing you do is that the only thing that makes you feel alive is if you expose yourself, that raises your stress hormones. So paradoxically, re-exposing yourself to danger makes you feel alive, while safety becomes, gives you a feeling of discomfort. And we see this all the time. Like I'm feeling a patient right now who was raped at gunpoint in a hotel room in Las Vegas, and it's over, and she starts 
um, becoming a prostitute and making a living with very, very dangerous people because she feels alive when guys threaten her and do terrible things to her. Uh, and she feels dead and nothing unless she's involved in a similar situation. Uh, what we see in with combat soldiers, uh, they enlist, they hate it the first time around, and next time they go, they come home. And the, the best depiction is in the movie The Hurt Locker, uh, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, you see these guys, they're very good as long as they're in combat, very competent, very loving with each other. They come home, and then they play in the backyard with their kid, and they feel nothing. As the whole issue is, how can you continue to feel something? And so, um, a guy I do a lot of work with, and I call my best friend, uh, lives in Australia. And he was asked by the Australian Armed Forces to look at all the guys who go into combat from Afghanistan, 13,600 people. And the Australian government made money available to do brain tests on them and immune function, etc., etc. And I was just with him again this last weekend, and he showed me more of his data. And what he shows is that before these guys go off to war, they're actually much healthier than the rest of the population. Their brains are very sharp, their cognitive functions are very sharp. And then they come back after their first deployment, and their brain waves, I'll tell you a little bit more about brain waves in a second, have changed. And the brain waves that have to do with calm, reflective, serene states have sort of been knocked out. They're not symptomatic yet. But they are sort of, their whole brain is a state of hyperarousal. And then some of them re-enlist. Some of them re-enlist because coming home is dull and boring. And so and the other thing that happens, and the US Marine Corps understands this very well, is that when you're under danger, you bond very strongly to the people who you are in danger with. And it starts off when you're a little kid. When you're a little kid, you but the more scared you are, the more you cling to your mother. And we know from animal experiments, for example, that if you um, have a little animal and you play a very loud noise, this little animal cling to, will cling to his mother. And then after a little while, the clinging, the, the sounding of the bell, becomes associated with a feeling of safety. Because the chemicals that get secreted as you cling to your mother are the, the chemicals that become a conditional response to the sounds. And so what, what happens to people is you can become attached to what originally very, very dangerous or frightening stimuli. So it becomes frightening, it becomes dangerous. Uh, it can become safe. So the way that people who deal with soldiers, though, they've always known that, how they deal with that is they expose a bunch of very young, innocent kids to great danger as they put them on machine fire and running things. Yes, and then, excuse me. People, uh, I think, in the back might have a little bit of a problem hearing. Do you mind speaking up just a bit? Okay. Thank you. I'll try. Uh, so, as young guys exposed, get exposed to a large amount of danger, they become very attached to the combat unit. And by the time that your basic training is over, you have been scared a lot. But at the same time, you feel very, very close to the people who you were in basic training with, and that from that moment on, you have a very strong adherence to your unit. You need that cohesion to your unit in order to be able to kill other people, because it becomes a world of us versus them. Now, ordinarily, you're not all that good in killing other people at random, but if you see the world divided in us versus them, and the more scared you are, the world becomes divided in us versus them, the more you feel loyal to your, to your troop, makes you feel dangerous, and the more you feel that the other person, people are going to put you in danger. That goes pretty well until your best friend gets killed. Because at that point, you feel personally unbelievably injured, and you feel like you're being injured, and then you start taking revenge, and you start doing things to other people that breaks all moral codes. And then you start feeling, really feeling like a freak because you have done terrible things in the name of love in the country that you really cannot go home. I wonder what you think about it. No, the yeah. talk, you know, Tom is my, sorry, my US Marine Corps sergeant. That's exactly that same yeah. 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 And it's this bonding that makes it possible for people to do it, but the bonding at the same time kills you. Uh, so it's, 
it all has to do with love and hate. And at the end, sort of, in a way, the love also is about distortion. And you know that as, as journalists also, you get very attached to fellow journalists, and when they die, you just get the story from us. And you cannot go home again, because nothing means anymore at home, and something means something when you're going across. It's, it's a very tough thing. And so, um, psychologically, it's like that, but all these things have biological equivalence, and so your biology gets reset to not feel anything unless you get exposed to danger. And your current life doesn't mean very much. So these, your brain sort of gets get changed, and your brain gets it becomes very good ex being, as long as you're exposed to danger. And you see this in policemen, you see this in prostitutes, you see it in people who are chronically involved in very high stress situations. But once they're taken away from that situation, they start collapsing, they become ill, uh, and drink themselves to death and do everything. So that's the, the big issue. And that's very much also the big issue with trauma. Uh, and because we have limited time, I'll just show you one other piece. We well, can go into more detail if you are interested. And so the question is, how can you get people out of that state where only danger gives you a sense of being alive, where only being scared gives you a sense of being present. And it's a very <coughs> difficult issue. Um, by the writing issue is a very interesting question. And we do a lot of writing, and there's a fair, fair amount of decent research on writing. The research on writing for PTSD per se is not that great. The outcome is not terrific. But then when you read a book like Carl Malanti's book, which I imagine you have read and Carl, Carl Malanti was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford at the same time as Bill Clinton was, and he enlisted in the US Marine Corps, and we enlisted again after that. And this past year, that's it, three years ago, he won the Pulitzer Prize for a book called um, his Vietnam Experiences. And then after that, he wrote a book called um, what it's like to go to war. Mm -hmm. And he writes about the pleasure of killing, mm -hmm. the incredible bonding you have to your fellow soldiers, the seeing yourself reflected in the people who you kill, and as you shoot somebody saying, oh my God, I'm killing somebody who's just like me, and feeling this very close connection with the people who are, you try to disembody. And then coming back and feeling nothing for anything, and then trying to recreate a sense of being a human being and belonging to larger mankind. So Malantis has done a lot of writing, and he's also done a lot of meditation. It's the best book about war and ever uh, including war and peace. Uh, and he writes about this very long process of needing to be by yourself, and to meditate, and to feel every part of yourself. If I would have to say, what do you think is the best known strong intervention like biology stuff uh, for trauma? I would say vipassana meditation. Going to a Buddhist monastery and sit and feel and sit and feel and sit and feel and rewire your brain to be capable of feeling the small nuances of life and have no essential input whatsoever. So what is that doing to recalibrate the brain chemically, and how does that then? It that helps you to pay attention to the small details of life, and to probably do what I'm trying to say here. So, so this is to my, my this is one of the three most important studies ever done in PTSD, done by my Australian. So, done by my done by my by Alexander Bufan. So what he does, he's put, he puts electrodes over people's brains and see what the electrical activity is in, in the brain underneath those electrodes in response to an, a non-significant stimulus, something like A. And what you see is that as long as you're not traumatized, these electrodes of the different parts of the brain are all in synchrony with each other. And the, the whole brain is totally engaged to process something as trivial as A. And so the way that normal brain takes in sounds and sights and images and basic activity is you generate what's called an N200. An N200 is a filtering wave of your brain 
and it tells you don't pay attention to anything else, but focus on whatever you see and hear right now. The filter. Then your brain generates what's called the P300. P300 is the way in which your brain grasps new pieces of information. So all the new information got into your brain via this particular way, P300. So your brain takes something in and then processes to see what it means and how significant it is. So you can't take anything in without that particular way. Traumatized people, when they hear a non survival type sound, don't generate a filtering rate, and they generate a lousy P300. That means that they have a very hard time taking in and processing ordinary information. And so the issue is not the trauma, the issue is normal stuff. The brain is rewired to be very good at dealing with danger and threat, but your brain has a very hard time just taking in day-to-day -day experiences. And with that comes a loss of pleasure and a loss, loss of joy. This is not a rational process. And so there is, to my mind, two ways of rewiring that. One is to force your brain to pay attention to just small stimuli. To reset your brain, to not get a lot of input, but just sit. And notice how your big toe is moving, how your breath is moving, and to rewire your brain. It takes a very long time. The quicker way of doing it is something that is some work that we are doing right now is through neurofeedback by having people play computer games with their own brain waves so you can reset these brain waves to become normal. Writing, I'm not sure how it fits in. Writing clearly is a very effective way of doing things. And what is very clearly important for trauma is that just like we could barely look at the pictures that Finbar was showing us, we don't want to know. We don't want to talk about it. And so a very large part of being a traumatized person is that you don't want to know what you know and feel what you feel. Mm -hmm. Writing is one of the best ways of overcoming that barrier. And so the research of Jamie Pennebaker in, at the University of Texas shows that, like many people in this room, have probably written angry, despondent, letters to people who have let them down, messed them up, betrayed them and hurt them. So writing to somebody, as people in this room know, is, can be an enormously liberating thing for yourself. You don't write for that person, you write for yourself to give yourself permission to feel all the things that you feel. And it's very clear that allowing yourself to feel everything you feel and knowing yourself, knowing everything you know, is a tremendously important road to liberation from trauma. But I think for many people it's not enough. In fact, I know for many people it's not enough. And the research doesn't bear out that the worst of trauma can be resolved by just talking about it or just writing about it. And so you still need to do something else to make your body uh, feel safe and to feel deeply safe on a very visceral somatic level. And that's something that psychologists and psychiatrists have up to now been very poor at because we don't pay attention to sensory information and the life of the body. And so I think a very important part of overcoming trauma, for example, is to go to somebody who can work in your bodily state to reinstall a sense of total and complete safety, which is basically gets, that's, gets destroyed by being a traumatized person because your body is always hyper aroused to deal with threats, but no longer can deal with safety. So you basically have to reboot the hardware. Right? You have to reboot the hardware. Yeah. 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 So, Finbar, is there anything else you'd like to ask uh, Bessel at this point? Um, no, I mean, that, that, that makes perfect sense. And um, one of the things Sergeant Brennan has been doing is, is not just the writing, that's, that's part of it, but he's, he's been doing this, um, I don't know the details for it, but for, you know, image, re, 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 recurring image therapy, or something like that. Um, but uh, but we're really doing EMDR. Could be, could be that. Mm. Sure. And MDR is EMDR. EMDR. If you want to see a movie, it's a five-minute clip. I can show you what it is and what it, what difference it makes. It's quite nice, actually. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah. 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 Okay, let's see. It. So what people do is they talk about something else. 
they talk politics, they talk mm -hmm. history, they talk anthropology, but they will do anything to not really feel <coughs> the memory of what really happened. And so writing is easier than talking. Yeah, so many people in this room know from personal experience that writing something on a piece of paper activates a different part of your brain than yakking. Yeah, so, um, what's also striking about this, and this is what you always see in pictures like Finbar's, is that people carry the trauma in their body. Yeah, they get like this. Huh? And all of your pictures are so haunting to us because we see people frozen in a position of terror and threat. And as long as your body is in a position of terror and threat, your mind cannot get into any other state. Yeah, for example, I just sit like, the, like she does right now. It's just, Make a full life yourself. Sit like this. No, nobody, nobody else do that? Try it. <laughs> Let's sit like this. Uh, and you cannot, feel, you cannot feel safe and comfortable as long as you sit like this. And so what's so important when you work with these people is to get them into a state where their bodies feel calm because as long as you sit like this, you cannot be open for anything at all. Uh, so you need to work with the body. So what happens here is when you deal with traumatized people, they are in this body state of feeling terrified, and the more they talk, the worse they get oftentimes. And then this is the first time, the first movie I saw, which inspired me tremendously in my own work, where I saw somebody get out of that state. And what is interesting to me, this is called EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. It's a very crazy treatment method. I'm very much non-Freudian and not National Institute of Mental Health, although they funded my research for this. Um, and that is, you ask people to evoke the image in their, in their mind of what happened. But you don't ask them to talk about it. Just say, what did you see? And you say, what did you hear? But you don't have to talk about it. What did you smell? You don't have to talk about it. What were you thinking at that time? Like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Or I knew this was going to happen. Or you stupid shit. You only have yourself to blame. Some horrendous statement. A statement oftentimes that keeps haunting people and keeps coming back and says people have flashbacks to their cognition after the trauma and they keep saying the same horrible thing to themselves as they're being said back. So what you do here is at your point you activate the part of the brain where these little fragments of the past are stored. Then what you do is you ask people to move their eyes from side to side. Very crazy. I was totally skeptical about it when I first heard about it. And then you move your eyes from side to side. And then after a while, you get other images, other sensations in your body, and other stuff comes up. And you go back to the original trauma, and people say, it's not so bad anymore. I'm feeling better. For me, this is enormously interesting, because it is so different from what people ordinarily do. And then later on, we did the research that shows that at the time that you're being traumatized, a part of your brain called the thalamus, the part that integrates the sounds, the images, the thoughts, uh, the sounds into the story, the autobiography, the thalamus shuts down at this point. And so you, you, but what you keep is the images and the sounds and the smells, but the story is sort of a different part of your brain. So being a traumatized person means that you continue to have these images and these sounds reverberating in your brain over and over. Again, and we can do with these eye movements that you activate the pathways from the thalamus and you set up 40 megahertz thalamocortical rhythms, which is how we normally process this information. Okay. Um, so, so what happens after this, the story becomes totally different. Okay. Here's the last part of her. I went here and then I was going to die. She told me that I was dead. It's the same person after two sessions, beginning of this third session, and uh, being a body, uh, as a body-oriented person, most of you probably aren't, uh, you see a totally different person sitting there. And the person who happens to sit, to my mind, not happens to sit, but was destined to sit, because we're destined to hold the positions that our brains dictate to us, and she sits like a Buddha. Maybe it's hard for you to sit like this before, but maybe you want to sit like this for a second. <laughs> and because when you sit like this, you put your shoulders back, you crane your neck a little bit, show people that sternocleidomastic muscle, 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 
and you sit like this, you put your butt in the chair. And now, for those of you who do it, none of you want to learn anything, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's up to you. Uh, but when you sit like this, if I say, now, hate Dick Cheney, you can't. <laughs> and because this body posture does not get you into a psychophysiological state that makes it possible to activate that particular emotional system. Okay? Um, you believe that? Uh, yeah. I mean, he still dicks me, dicks me, And now, let me just show you the rest. Can you describe what happened that day for me? Yeah, I was up to yellow. So now she's reading from the teleprompter. She's no longer reliving the memory. She is remembering the memory. And when we do neuroimaging on people before and after, we see that the change in the brain is the activation of a part over here called the anterior cingulate. And the anterior cingulate is the part of your brain that helps you to distinguish past from present. It helps your brain to distinguish between cognition <coughs> and emotion. So it gives you a sense of distance. If you do meditation or yoga regularly, you actually can cultivate that part of your brain and you can make that part of your brain larger as part of research that we do. And so uh, you can actually make your brain capable of taking more distance from the past, not by talking about what happened to you, but by changing your orientation to the state of your body, the state of your being. And now it's a story. Instead of a reliving, uh, trauma is about reliving. Uh, you relive the same thing over and over again, the same rage, the same helplessness, the same images, the same sounds, keep coming. And now you change the brain. And I'm still fine. So I'm going to begin with because the roads were wet. Uh, Stopped behind the white line. The light was red. I recognized that the moon wondered why. Looked up, saw a car come speeding at me. I just knew it was going to hit me and I was going to die. I didn't. It's fading. I can almost say right now. Don't even ask me anything more about the accident because I'm not interested in discussing it. <laughs> not that I want to hide it, but I'm not. It's over. <laughs> uh, and that's not something your uncle would have said. No, yeah. right. He's still there. Huh? He's still there. Yeah. Yeah. But no, this is the this is the same therapy that the uh, Sergeant Brown. Uh, good, good, good. Amazing. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. fascinating. That's fantastic. Um, so how did you want to proceed? Well, I, is there anything more you want to comment on with um, vessels or vessels? Um, no. Well, it's 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 interesting about the uh, the meditation. What you say because uh, I was I was told the same thing uh, previously. Yeah. And I've, I've tried it, and it definitely feels like. But it's hard, huh? It's very hard. But you traumatize. It's hard for anybody. Yeah, but that's what apps are for. Right. right. Like meditation apps. Are <laughs> <laughs> you don't actually have to do it. You do it, but it's just like, oh, there's my iPad. I'm going to sleep or whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, it, 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 it's uh, it's good. And little binaural beat machines are good too. Mm -hmm. And beside, if you're looking for a good app. Okay. Is that one of yours? No, no, I don't make money on that. Well, I think at this point uh, we'll we'll open uh, questions. Uh, um, open this up to the uh, the audience, and so if anybody wants to make a comment, just indicate to me, and I will uh, write your name on the list. So anybody uh, is free to make a comment. Somebody, okay, right here. What you be um, next? What is the uh, the latest treat uh, treatment for PTSD, particularly in veterans hospitals? And what's what's going on? Hmm? Let's go. Oh, it's, it's, I just came back from the trauma meetings. There are some people who say that blasting people with the memory of the trauma is a treatment of choice. That's what's been treated. That's been taught right now at the VA. When I hear that our poor veterans aren't getting any treatment at the VA, my reaction is, thank goodness they're not. 
Mm. Because what's being taught to the VA is so horrible. Um, I think blasting people's memory of their trauma is not the way to do, but that's what's being, what's being taught right now. What, I'm sorry, what is it being taught? But the, what's being taught right now is that, um, that the prevailing things being taught is you need to expose people to their trauma and sort of blast people to the same thing over and over again so they get desensitized from it. You mean I having think, them repeat what happened? Yeah. And that so goes against everything, everything we know happens in the brain. It's so wrong, basically. It's not, it's not what happens. And the analysis, the data show that it really doesn't work on it. So why are they doing it? They're doing it because um, uh, it makes the researchers who, have, who own this treatment feel better. Oh, yes. Do you think it's helpful? Blasting people with the same memory over and over again? Doesn't sound like it's very helpful. That. <laughs> that sounds better. Yeah. And that was how many sessions? Three? That's a three session. Oh, well, it's a very simple trial. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, we have uh, this woman here, and then uh, the woman in the black in the back, and then you're next, and then I'll. Yeah, okay. So please. Hi, my name is Alicia. I had a question for each of you. So, um, Finmar, I just I took a program in narrative and documentary practice yeah, last year, and every photojournalist, um, war photographer, <coughs> or war journal, like writer that I've spoken to since then has talked about Tim's death and how it's had this huge impact on them in terms of the way they now think about going back to conflict. And so it's, it's just literally come up in every single conversation how um, Tim and Chris's death has had this huge impact on the whole community, sort of taking a step back and rethinking what's going on. So for you, I, I, could you talk a little bit more about that? Like what is, you know, you know, you said it made me think, like am I being selfish? Like what are the other reactions and positive changes or, you know, that you think have come out of that, you know, horrible um, event? And um, doc doctor, for you, I, I wanted to know, we talk a lot about veterans and combat veterans, especially when we talk about PTSD and trauma, but what about civilians who've lived through conflict for decades um, and they continue to live through it at times for longer than veterans mm -hmm. do? And um, obviously their experience is totally different because they're not actually, you know, actively killing people. So the moral psychology becomes different. So what is kind of the most, uh, the latest research on what helps civilians most and, and communities and things like that? So those are my two questions. Uh, well, first of all, for me, I'm sitting here instead of um, being in Syria is the first obvious kind of um, uh, answer to you know how how it's changed things one way or another positively I would think at the moment um, but also uh, definitely a lot of journalists have have uh, have rethought what they're doing or how they're doing it um, since the death of Chris and Tim uh, that day um, for me yeah I went in, I went into this sort of feeling of numbness for quite a long time afterwards and wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, and I think now if, uh, it's, uh, it's a year and a half later and I would say that I wouldn't necessarily not cover conflict again, but I think we have to draw the distinction between uh, covering conflict and covering combat. So uh, those are two very different things. Um, I, can, I can go to a conflict zone and remain away from the front lines uh, and, and focus on, you know, for example, the, the, those images I showed you of the road in Libya didn't necessarily involve being shot at. Um, so I know, I know people, you know, Sebastian Junger has said that if he ends up in a situation again where he's being shot at, um, then he's failed. Uh, he, you know, he's the guy who made uh, Rest Repo with Tim. Um, and the feeling is very much that uh, I don't feel like any of the pictures I took in Libya were particularly good um, uh, and certainly not w worth the kinds of risks that we were taking and Tim felt the same way that's that's why we decided to leave he then had another idea that he wanted to go back and try and do but um, and, I, and I understand that but you know is it worth it no it's not worth it even if you get an amazing picture and you die is it worth it no and it's certainly not for getting crappy pictures or disposable pictures that are just feeding a news cycle I mean how, how many of the images that we're seeing now out of Syria or that we saw out of Libya were pretty much interchangeable from day to day? Um, but what is a great picture when you say it's not worth it for a crappy picture, but maybe for a great picture? Like when you're talking about life and death, what is? I mean, what does that distinction mean for photographers? Exactly. If I had I an answer to that, that, I don't have an answer to that question yeah. because I can't tell you. But if you think back about pictures that may have changed the course of a war, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you could say that was a great picture. So there are pictures from Vietnam that we can think of uh, that would certainly fit into that category. Those pictures are pretty rare. But the thing is, people have to be out there taking pictures for those pictures to occur. So where do you say this is worth it or not worth it? You can't really. There's no. It's it's not that simple. Um, but certainly, I know a lot of people who've, who've you know reconsidered what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I'm just I'm just one of many. So the question was between the relationship between military and. Um, no, I mean, civilian trauma, sorry. I just, the, yeah. What's the latest research in terms of the best ways to deal with civilian yeah. trauma? Because well, the, the, a lot of the talk is with veterans and combat veterans, and I, I, right. I haven't heard as much about how Actually, civilians deal My particular with interest is most of all child abuse. Mm. I, mean, I primarily work with kids. And um, I just had an editorial op ed page in the New York Times about this issue, in that right now there's all this interest in the war, and money being shuttled into veterans programs, that money essentially is taken out of programs to help domestic violence women and children. So it's at the expense of, of children. And this is what always happens. You know, you, people go to war and the vets get, lo get tremendously hurt and, and they get a lot of attention um, and people forget everything that's been learned before. Um, there's a quote in, from Abram Carter, who sort of founded this field in the Second World War, who says, it seems like every generation has to forget all the lessons from the previous generation and starts from scratch again. And that's totally true. Yeah. Well, people know how to treat this stuff after the First World War, Second World War, Vietnam, and then people keep reinventing the wheel. And then, um, historically, what always happens is slowly the interest in veterans goes down. Huh? There's all this rah, 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 let's help our veterans. Five years later, nobody wants to pay for it anymore, so they get forgotten. Uh, money is being put in the civilian sector. And then <coughs> war happens again. The patriotic fervor gets people to give a lot of money to the war. The money gets taken out of services for civilian populations and go into the war. And then we learn something for civilian populations that, that from war soldiers that's then plowed back in civilian sectors. That's how it has been for 150 years. And that's something you see right now again. Uh, the treatment is not all that different because the core issue of getting stuck in a, in a state of terror and then getting rewiring your brain to actually feel calm when you're under, under threat and feel nothing at other times is pretty steady whether you're a kid or an adult or a man or a woman. But the core issue is the same. Okay, thank you. Um, the woman in the back and then you're next. Thank you both for an outstanding talk. Um, my name is Elizabeth Meenham, and I was actually going to ask a very similar question, but about, you know, for people, civilians in war-affected populations who are not um, moving into an area of safety, and so they don't have that opportunity to go back to normal stimuli. Um, and I just wanted to hear a bit more about intervention when you're still in a place of danger, whether you're in a refugee camp or still in a post conflict zone. Is there any more you can that? <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is exactly the reason that I'm interested in. That's why I'm here and, and looking at uh, some of the psychology courses that I'm taking as part of my fellowship because I'm dealing, as you saw with the pictures in Congo, a population that's in a permanent state of fight or flight, and there is obviously no access to the most basic of health care. People are dying from, uh, you know, the simplest infections and, and, and very preventable diseases. So the idea that they would ever even have access to any kind of psychological counseling is just not going to happen. So um, yeah, this is I, I don't there's there's no answer for, for that. There's, there's no access for them to it. But um, if I'm a journalist trying to navigate those areas and, and dealing with uh, <coughs> subjects who I'm reporting on, people who I'm reporting on, um, I certainly want to understand how they are trying to survive under these kinds of conditions um, in order to be able to relate to them on, on some kind of level. I'm not going to be able to offer them any kind of therapy, but um, hopefully that some kind of interaction can at least be um, a sympathetic one. My response, not, I couldn't publish this because I don't have enough references for this, for a, for a scientific journal. My response would be the most important thing for people is to be meaningfully engaged in day-to-day -day activities. And I think the hard thing of refugee camps and uh, displaced person camps is the wandering around meaninglessly in a culture where you don't belong. 
And um, I think I've consulted quite a bit to refugee programs in Europe and here. What's striking to me is that the Germans and the Dutch and the Norwegians and the Swedes are fantastic in providing all kinds of therapies for their refugees. And they have a terrible outcome. In the US, we give terrible programs for refugees, but it's possible to get a license to work. And that means you can make money and you can come home with a paycheck and provide for your family. And the capacity to provide for your family and to be engaged in meaningful work for the people who you love and mean something to is probably the single most useful way of overcoming your trauma. Namely to be, to use your body and your mind and your hormones and all the stuff that you have floating around to be meaningfully engaged in the, in the present. And so being unemployed, being of a disability, being not a member of society, not building anything, is a surefire way of keeping people uh, in a state of hyper arousal, downtroddenness, depression, and meaninglessness. And when you're in that state, you will have your nightmares and you will have your flashbacks because all your hormones, hormones that are meant to be engaged in the present aren't being engaged. So that, that's, so it's not first of all, go see a counselor. First of all, is do something with your body that really makes you feel like you're doing something meaningful to yourself. And that's, I find that fascinating yeah. because yeah. In, in a place like Congo, uh, people are living very much day to day. Right. It's a survival situation. Uh -huh. So they have to be engaged in the moment. They're not, yeah. they're not necessarily trying to process any trauma that they may have experienced. They're, they're very much trying to provide for their next meal, for their family. Um, trying to get to a place of safety. So there is that, there, there's no opportunity to remain idle, that, that kind of yeah. uh, stagnating uh, sense that, um, that could lead to, to, to the kind of problems that you're talking about. So in, in a way that, that may, uh, in a perverse sense, be uh, responsible for um, the level of resilience that they can show in the face of this, this kind of adversity. You see, my, my, my reaction to that, what I would think would happen, is that on a day-to-day -day basis you can function, but maybe when your teenage kid starts yelling at you or your honey does something that figures you the wrong way, you can still have a rather pure traumatic response and become extremely enraged or frozen in response to limited stimuli. Mm. And so their trauma processing might be helpful, but the overall the most important thing is that people are involved in meaningful actions. Mm. Okay, yes. Hi, um, my name is Lisa King. I'm a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School. Can, Can you speak up? Me? Just Sorry. like I should speak up. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Lisa King. I'm a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy over at the Kennedy School. And I do a lot of work in Native America. Um, in Indian country, we have the largest number of enlistees by far of any ethnic group in this country in the military. They come back, they're in the communities. Um, and, and we also have the largest, highest numbers of um, domestic violence, child abuse. We have really sort of like the worst end of the spectrum on all of these so social traumas. And I'm wondering if there's been any work that connects these two things. And, um, and, and how sort of the ultra dramatic becomes normalized from people coming back from war and how that can be passed into the community and the family. Has there been any work that connects these, these two um, Realities. Actually, I worked on a Blackfoot Indian reservation in Montana the last two years. I would go out there about every other month, specifically why, because I was very interested in your question. And I wanted to see it sort of with my own eyes. And what I saw was this devastated communities that had, had lost their sense of meaning and poisoned communities, basically because the elders who want respect actually were, had been the abusers and the drunks who had beaten up and molested their kids and now they wanted to re-establish their rightful position in the Indian hierarchy but they had done too much to destroy it and I think the whole social fabric that I saw was just so destroyed that I think the best thing for them is to immigrate to another place and start all over again. That was my, I, I didn't see anything hopeful. Okay. Uh, 
تغطيته للفروض شو اقدرت فيه على المستوى الشخصي وشو اضافت على المستوى الشخصي والمستوى المهني. Just explain, we have some journalists uh, from Jordan here today, that's why there is an address. So my question, uh, your coverage to the conflict and, and, and working in war zone, how did that affect you personally? What did that, uh, y your work add to you on personal level? Uh, so what impact did it have on me? Yeah, and what did it add to you also? What did it add to me? In what sense? Uh, what does he mean by what did it add to me? As an experience on, let's say, humanitarian level, how, how do you view war now after your experience? Okay. Um, so the first part of that is, uh, is I experienced many of the sensations that, that you've described, this, this feeling of numbness, um, disconnectedness in terms of uh, friendships, relationships, and uh, a disembodiment sometimes, certainly when immediately when coming back from a zone of conflict, I would, I would uh, come back from two months in Afghanistan and be walking down the street in London or Paris and feel this out-of-body sensation where I was watching myself walk down the street, in a sense. Um, it wasn't necessarily an unpleasant sensation, but it was a vivid sensation that I was not in my body. And, um, and then also this, this sort of feeling of remoteness and numbness um, leaves you to feel quite despondent at times. And so you have to find ways of dealing with that. And some of the remedies that you've talked about today are, are ones that I've, that I've used. Um, in terms of what it's added to me, I, th I think a level, you know, you gain certain experiences and certain understanding of, of um, how people can be affected. We're all affected in some way. And um, I would say that uh, my own experiences then inform the work that I'm doing um, depending on where I go. My idea of co what, what do I think of conflict now, uh, that's a, quite a difficult question to answer. Um, nobody's going to say war is good, um, but w war is a reality. I mean, it's always happening somewhere, pretty much. Um, and as journalists who, who cover these kinds of events, <coughs> we're, we're drawn to these dramatic events and, and things that we feel are important. I first went to Afghanistan, for example, in 2008, um, not because it was a big story at that time. The focus in 2008 was very much on Iraq. There was very little <coughs> attention being paid to Afghanistan. But uh, I'm Canadian, and there was a very big Canadian contingent uh, that was the main fighting force in Afghanistan. And as a Canadian, I felt like I wanted to know wh why they were there, what they were doing there. and. Uh, I felt like I had something to add to the conversation in terms of telling the story back home in Canada. Uh, and at the same time, I think on some level, I wanted to see how I would react to those kinds of situations. Combat's a very intense experience. And having heard those stories that my grandfather had told me, I wanted to know uh, in a way if I could measure up to him as a man and to other people who have experienced those things. You just want to see how how you how you will cope? Did you blame yourself for getting an award for a picture that you took in the conflict zone? Min, min, uh, well, that wasn't a conflict zone. Uh, I don't know which one, which picture you're talking about. In general, if you get an award for a picture you took in a conflict zone or in a conflict zone, do you do you blame yourself because you think you actually benefited somehow from the war? Okay, I would, I would never blame myself uh, for getting an award, but there is something a little bit off about taking, um, receiving any acclaim for something that is quite distasteful in a sense. But what you can take satisfaction in is the idea that you may have been highlighting an important situation or story. So, um, you know, there's, there's no joy to be taken from getting a picture of a dying child or person or any of that kind of thing. It's, it's repulsive in a way. Um, but part of the responsibility that we have as journalists is to document situations. Awards are completely arbitrary and out of our hands as journalists. And it's not the reason that we do the kind of work that we do. Can, can I comment on this? This is actually the question that got me into this field. And that is, um, no, I used to be into psychopharmacology and there were some decent drugs for uh, PTSD that we're looking at. 
And the first veteran I gave one of these new drugs for, I said, after two weeks, so how was the drug? And he said, I didn't take it. And I said, why not? He said, I realized that if my symptoms go away, I stop being a living memorial to my friends who died. And my task in life is to be, be a memorial to my friends. And that knocked my socks off. I thought it was just astounding that a person would voluntarily, involuntarily be disposed to give up a life in order to be a living memorial to dead friends. And that really just pulled me into this field. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. This has been very moving and informative. And I, I just want to go back to the images for a moment. And you talked um, about this as well in terms of us looking at the images and how we might respond um, by shutting down ourselves and, and um, the speech pathways in the brain that shut down. Because I found myself looking at these, these wonderful images feeling not quite as impacted as I, I should or might have it at one time. Um, and as a consumer of media, I feel so inundated by these images that are everywhere on the internet, that every time I open the New York Times, they're in my children's video games. And I'm wondering what the experience or the cost to society in the way the news is being reported in terms of PTS at a societal level. And then also was really um, quite intrigued by your question of I can cover, I want to cover the conflict. I don't that doesn't mean I have to cover the combat. I have to say on a personal level, I found the pictures of the roads and the picture of the oil refinery to be the most moving because what that did for me is that brought to me the context of the mm. war. Why are we fighting this war? And mm. that struck a far deeper chord for me than most of the pictures that were shown today. Exactly, and that's a realization that I've come to the longer that I've been doing this. And the very reason I chose to do that series of images is because we were so inundated by these violent scenes of men running around with guns firing all over the place and they just become a blur after a while, there's no meaning. Um, no matter how good a picture is, if it's not really informing us in a new way, then what's the point of it? And what's even more so, what's the point of taking the risk to get that picture? Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, absolutely, I, I totally agree. And the kinds of stories that I've been doing over the last year are much more leaning toward those kinds of contextual um, storytelling uh, formats rather than going for the obvious um, dramatic news picture and and so yeah that's that's what I feel now that I c might be able to contribute journalistically to the to the conversation my question would then be is there an appetite yeah for actually, there, is, there is there is, people yes. would, okay. yeah I mean I'm fortunate that I work for a big global media I work for Reuters a big global media company and so we have outlets and uh, and it gets noticed when mm -hmm. somebody approaches a story differently in that sense. And when I've done those stories, they've been used quite, quite successfully. Yeah. But you, you had, there was a, a component to that, to the societal a, impact. I think it's an enormously important question, but I can't say anything about it. You know, <laughs> because your observation is the observation that I share with you, that we get inundated, blasted with it. It's unnatural. We shouldn't be getting all, you know, we should get these pictures in our natural brain, our natural being, once in a while, so we, we're fully engaged with it. And now we get inundated by it, and I'm sure we get downregulated ourselves, and we become numb also. Um, I don't know what to do about it, but it's a very serious concern, and a serious concern raising our kids, of course. But I have nothing sensible to say about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. How convenient. I was actually going to raise a very similar um, observation. And um, I actually work in the field of conflict resolution. And I think, um, and I w came at it um, through a period of time where I worked in politics, uh, just in the run up to the 08 election. And I've actually been realizing for the past few days I have sort of a PTSD about tomorrow. <laughs> um, because. I did a lot of uh, research and investment in election protection and became a specialist on electoral fraud. Um, and I was just, the, the reason this is, ties into all of this, forgetting how I feel about tomorrow, um, is that in the beginning you made the comment about how the more we see these images, the more we become numb. And it, then I noticed, and then you said how people in those situations go back again and again and I noted what Finbar told 
your story was the exact echo of what he said. And then yes, that ties... I'm a living cliche. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, all. Well, then that's the perfect segue to say what I was going to say, which is how important that you made the shift that you made. Because if you think about we're inundated, if you set aside the, the war images, we're also inundated by political images and political stories. And I've been asking for years, why aren't we getting upset about the fact that our democracy is shot? And I really am looking at the fact, what I keep going, why are we this way? Why are we this way? And I feel like I've seen the strands of what we've become in what you're saying. I mean, it's That's very... That's a scary thought. It, well, it is scary. No, but it, you should but read the latest It's hard Harper's. to argue with that, isn't it? No, but it, it... If you're getting addicted to more and more violent, angry images, I yep. imagine I'm not the only person mm -hmm. in this room who keeps sort of checking what the polls look like for tomorrow and yeah. who get addicted in our own way to... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but uh, thank you both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very timely, very interesting. Yeah. Thanks for your comment. But mm -hmm. your comment is very profound, actually. And, and the question for us, how we can screw it back down to, we talk about real stuff without scaring the hell out of each other. It's really... But, it, but I think it gets back to the, the, I guess my ultimate point was, yeah. if journalists begin to make a shift in how they approach what's a story, it might actually have the net effect of helping us shape the way we're approaching stories as the public. It's interesting. It's one way to look at it. Idealistic. Sure. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Tamar. I just finished reading Michael Kimmel's Guyland, and I can't help thinking whether or not um, your interest when you were younger um, in covering combat and war has to do with being a young man, and your hormones are different now. I don't know how old you are, but you're not 20. Right? <laughs> so. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm just wondering if that plays into things. You know, sort of as people age, they also get less attracted. The adrenaline is different, or I don't know what... So I'm asking. There aren't too many old war photographers. That's yeah. Right. And, and so, it, you know, is it true biology? Is, is it... You know, I would say happen to young men as they grow up. I mean, yeah. Is that I would, a ridiculous question? No, not at all. Um, yeah, I would say there's an element of that. Uh, you certainly feel less invincible than you do when you're younger. Um, and when you when you do start losing friends and colleagues, uh, as you said, then you this idea that you can convince yourself that nothing will ha bad will happen to me, that whole facade just cracks um, and you can't you can't go on that anymore um, even though you knew it was a false construct to begin with it really becomes you know uh, transparent um, so it's a crutch you can't lean on anymore but but biologically I would probably yeah I don't know when they look around I don't see that wisdom comes with aging necessarily um, I'm not sure you know, when I look at politicians scaring the hell out of everybody, the guys in their 50s and 60s, I'm not so sure about whether people learn from experience to become mellower and more generous. Okay, we have. Okay, go ahead. And then. Hi, my name is Kara. Thank you for the presentation. Speak up, Kara, so the phone, if I can hear you. Uh, my name is Kara, and um, thank, you. thank you for the presentation. And I just wanted to ask you about um, one of the images you had was of um, a rebel soldier. I think you said that you put him in the back of the truck he was wounded. And I just wondered about that. Um, it reminded me of that whole story of the war photographer. I think he actually was a war photographer, but he was a photographer um, capturing images of the famine in Ethiopia, and there was that child yep. in Ethiopia. Yep. Um, and the vulture was Sudan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and I guess I just wondered, so how do you navigate that as a journalist in these zones? And how do you deal with who help and who not to help? And when you think about survivor skills, I imagine you have that obviously in different zones in the past. But do you experience that at all with the kids in the communities that you're in? So the question, sorry? Yeah, so, so the question was about the, those few images where um, we were lifting uh, wounded rebel into the back of a pickup car, and when do you choose? Uh, or into the trunk of the car. 
when do you choose to uh, get involved or intervene? Um, and what was the second part? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, survivor's guilt. So um, uh, I mean, every situation is going to be a little bit different. You have to you have to kind of play everything out as as it unfolds in front of you. But essentially. Um, yeah, I'm there as a journalist, but of course you're you're a person first. You're you're, you're a human being before you're a photographer. So uh, whoever an injured person might be in front of you, if that had been a Qaddafi soldier, I would have done the same thing. It really doesn't matter. It's an injured person who's been shot, who needs medical care. You're going to throw them in the car and get them to the nearest ambulance or um, first aid that they can have, or give first aid if you're in a position to do it. That wasn't the place to do it because the, the spot was under fire. Um, but yeah, there have been other occasions where you're driving through the bush in, in Congo and there's a woman going into labor or very sick on the side of the road and sometimes you can offer them a lift to the next village or town where they might be able to get some medical attention. Um, but you really just have to try and navigate each situation on its, on its own merit and just judge it. And, and ultimately, I think in terms of survivor's guilt, you have to make decisions about those situations in a way that you won't allow yourself to feel guilty about having done something or not having done something afterwards. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't feel a, a sense of survivor's guilt with colleagues who have died or been injured in the line of uh, working, but um, because it, I couldn't have done anything to prevent it. Maybe if I'd been there and somebody was bleeding out uh, in front of me, that's a different story, but I wasn't there when these things happened. So there's not a sense of guilt in the same sense. Um, just a sense of loss, a really deep sense of loss um, and sadness about it. But that's, that's very different from guilt. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, most of these things, you're a witness. You're not a participant. You're not an active player in it. Um, so I think it's very different from military who are engaging in a different way. But I just know that I used to be a reporter, and there was a journalism. We talked a lot in the newsroom about the connection to the people that you're covering, yep. and sort of that there has to be this bright line, and, and there is sometimes frowned upon when you're actually attached to the people that you're covering. No, I'm I'm great friends with uh, Sergeant Brennan now. You know, we, we're very close, and it's that very same thing that you mentioned about uh, experience in in traumatic situations or or combat um, bonding soldiers. It's the same. You know, we I, my my bed was beside his in the desert. We slept out overnight for more than a month, side by side, talking, listening, getting uh, you know uh, under fire almost every day for a month. Um, so it's impossible not to form a bond, and you can't pretend that it's otherwise. Yeah. Okay. But but the obverse is true also. Had the, there's a um, neuroscientist at the University of Chicago who studied doctors' reactions. Uh, doctors is a little bit like this because you get to see horrendous situations. Um, like if anybody in this room would be asked to stick a needle into somebody else's arm, for most people that would be a very tough thing to do. For me, it would be very easy because I was trained as a doctor. So you learn to not really feel the, another person's pain. I know that this person is having pain, but you don't really f learn to feel it. And so he shows how, as people get exposed more and more to this stuff, they shut off the empathy with people who, particularly people who don't look like them and are not like them. Mm. And we get very tribally organized. Yeah, so certain people are identified as, oh, they're just like us. We get very primitive. Mm. And you feel a lot of feeling for people you feel close to, but you also feel quite distant from people you don't feel close to. Mm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, you're next, and then Susan. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, my name is Josh, and I'm a journalist as well. Uh, my question was, was was basically if there, you know, if you uh, maybe for the doctor, if you can help put in context how, with the percentage of people who, or the you know the number of people who experience traumatic situations like. Uh, or if there's been studies on this and, and don't have any of these symptoms or don't express or don't have any of these feelings and if, if, you, if there have been studies in terms of the brain of if there's something about the brains of these people who aren't experiencing these types of effects well it's a lot of things it's a very, this is a very central issue of course I feel um, basically is if you keep being exposed you'll you'll go under it's the second in the second the second world war Every man has his breaking points. Mm -hmm. And so what is interesting to me is that in the Second World War, they decided like that no man should go on more than four 
five combat missions over Germany, let's say. That didn't happen with Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think it's a war, war crime on the part of Congress that they made it possible for people to go to war over and over again because we happen to know what happens to people's brains when we keep going to war over and over again and their brains really steadily start falling apart more and more. But this is the interesting thing as well, the difference between military and media because the military will go for a couple of deployments over the span of several years but journalists could be covering this stuff for 10 or 15 years as you know. Right. Um, and so it's not to, it, the role is different because we're as, you know we're not shooting people or being well sometimes being shot uh, right. but it's it's different but um, but there is a, a, a much longer uh, period of exposure for some you see people. a lot of stuff yeah. but what about secondary trauma kind it's of hardly the secondary for these guys well, in the sense that he's not shooting but he's seeing oh no, no. Yeah. seeing this stuff is a trauma mm -hmm. yeah. handling dead bodies mm -hmm. being the president that's that's all pretty bad stuff. No, I'd be surprised if a journalist who has stays in this over time would be able to escape this, actually. If you keep doing it, I don't know if you've met anybody who has. I never, I haven't, in my limited contact with people you've introduced me to. You know, if you get exposed enough, you get it. Okay, thank you. Um, Susan? Yes, thank you both so much. This is amazing. And this seminar series was founded, I think, seven years ago um, because people in the conflict resolution field really wanted to connect with journalists and think about how we talk about war. And so I'm wondering, Finbar in particular, if you have any idea for how we can change the story because it's very hard to photograph and talk about the war that doesn't happen, that's prevented in some way, or some acts in the Congo that maybe are moving in the right direction. But I think that's what we have to do. Otherwise, it's a cycle that keeps repeating itself, and you have the vivid images of war that people are attracted to in awful but powerful ways. And so how do you start to show something else? Sure. Uh, uh, excellent question. And um, I showed the images that I showed today because we were talking about a very specific subject. But when I am working in Congo, I'm, I'm trying to balance out those violent images with the way that uh, the way that most people live, which is uh, Congolese have a lot of fun. They, they're very vibrant and resilient um, people. And I, I show that a lot in my images. I show people uh, getting on with their lives and, and show this resilience and, and um, and the strength of character, and that's what I try to portray. And it, it's a much more nuanced um, view of, of the situation than what I was showing you today. This was very specifically oriented toward this. But I can give you one example of earlier this year when I went to cover, uh, I went to Sierra Leone to cover the um, the verdict of Charles Taylor's war crimes tribunal at The Hague. And he was accused of many war crimes in Sierra Leone, even though he'd been president of Liberia. And uh, the the signature of that war was amputations. People had their hands amputated. And so uh, in the days leading up to the verdict around the uh, criminal court counterpart that was in Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone, there were all these journalists running around looking for war amputees uh, from 10 years ago when the war took place and interviewing them, photographing them. And I, I decided this is absolutely not the way that I want to tell this story. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get in the car, I'm going to drive across the country to the border with Liberia where the rebels came in and just travel across the country and take a sort of state of the nation. What's happening in this country now, 10 years later? What are people talking about? What are they concerned about? Turns out they, they weren't the least bit interested in the verdict. They were too busy surviving day to day. Uh, they were still mining their diamonds. They were still trying to find their next meal. Um, but they were just getting on with life. And there weren't actually that many war amputees around. Most of them had just died. Um, but still there were a few in organizations that were getting money from a, you know, the UN and all these kinds of things. So there's this, this sort of self-perpetuating cycle of, of, uh, of course these people went through very traumatic events, but, but that kind of wasn't the story anymore. But it was the easy journalistic crutch to lean on. Um, and I remember covering the, the verdict on the day and the BBC guy came up to me and said, I hear you have a, a moratorium on photographing war apps. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah, you know, that's not really the story anymore. And he said, oh, your editors aren't going to like that. And it was, he was completely wrong. My editors were very happy with the, the sequence of stuff that I did um, because it, it was focusing much more on what the story is now in Sierra Leone, not 
what journalists think the story was 10 years ago. And, but nobody really wanted to do that story. But this, the, the sequence of images I did was much more representative of, of what I felt the narrative was at this point. And those pictures were very widely used um, and, uh, and published. Uh, so it, it's on the journalists, really, to, to create a narrative that, that feels more honest, I think. Um, and, and just to be show a little more integrity about about our storytelling uh, choices. Okay, we have. Do you want to make a comment on this? Well, I think what you say is, is fantastic. I, actually. I feel really good for you that you have have done this. Um, the story here actually is the story of, of Rwanda in a way also. Mm -hmm. Rwanda had the worst genocide imaginable since the, the German Holocaust, and Rwanda today is thriving and is doing very well. Um, the other story is an amazing story, it's a story about Germany. Uh, putting people in concentration camps, most horrendous crimes ever. And Germany is, has become one of the most humane, generous, uh, internationally cooperative countries in the world. Yes, but we can't say the same about Rwanda. Uh, your comments uh -huh. about Rwanda, uh -huh. I, I oh, agree good. it's done a lot of stuff, but okay. I lived there for a year uh -huh. and it is uh, uh -huh. not the same as the description you just gave uh -huh. of Germany. Good. Um, it's, uh, it's a very conflicted and traumatized place. Uh -huh. And the current government is actually probably responsible for more deaths in Congo than the guys who committed yeah. the genocide. Really? Yeah. Really? yeah. Really? yeah. Really? So that's, that's a, a, an easy narrative that, that uh, people jump it's on. That, oh, oh, great, these uh -huh. guys, they ended the genocide uh -huh. and they've got this great country where things work and they've got all these kind of health initiatives and so on. But it's a very brutal and nasty government. Um, Yes. No, this is Kagami, Kagami's narrative, and it's a very easy one for a guilty Western world to, to uh, go along with. Um, but as uh, this year, there was, there was a UN panel that basically said, we're no longer giving aid to Rwanda because of what they've done in Congo. Uh, the US cut off aid, the British cut off aid to Rwanda, yeah. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful. Ooh, That's yep. another one of those easy narratives that, yeah, that yeah, we, have, yeah, yeah. we can't yeah, fall yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. But, but I, I, your, point is, your, point is, your point is very valid, and certainly Germany. Um, would fit into that that category. Um, so so yeah. Sorry to cut you off. No no, it's good. I, no, I feel I feel no, strongly about that because your job set people straight. Because my, my because no, it's because I lived in Congo and I saw what the result of Rwandan action there is and and Rwanda. So but there you go. Yeah. Okay. More questions. Okay. Okay. Addressing you. Yes, please. Yes. Again, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm really interested in my question to you now, knowing what you have been through. What would your advice be to somebody who wants to take on this profession? I mean, on the one hand, you were on a mission, but on the other, there was a heavy price you paid. And doctor, does anybody have ever overcome a trauma 100%, like a child abuse, rape, war? Could it just become a memory at one point in someone's life? Okay, uh, thanks. Um, I do get a lot of uh, queries from young journalists who want to do the kind of work that I've, that I've done over the last little while. Um, and I read them with a certain amount of skepticism because if somebody emails me and says, I would love to be a war photographer or a war journalist, you have to ask why. Um, and I do ask them why. Well, why do you want to do this? And wh you know, what do you think it is that you'll be doing exactly? Um, because I think people have a very romanticized notion of what a war photographer or a war conflict correspondent might do. Um, and so there have been some people whose motives seem kind of true and pure to me, that they were interested in storytelling, that this is what was important to them, and they, they, they felt that they had um, something worthwhile to contribute, that they had their own perspective to offer on whatever it is that they wanted to do. But if it's somebody who just comes in saying, I want to have this glamorous role, well, it's not that glamorous, by the way, but it's, um, there's this sort of idea that it is. And if you want to be a war correspondent, to be a war correspondent, then I never wanted to be a war correspondent. That was never my plan. Um, I never wanted to be a photographer. That wasn't my plan either. I was, I was working as a writer. I started covering pop culture, arts, and music at a newspaper in Canada. You know, I was interviewing celebrities in hotel rooms and sort of somehow slid down this path. And, <laughs> and, and here I am. So, um, and thank God I did. But uh, I think that was probably more traumatic than anything. Um, but uh, um, so it, these, were, these were shifts that happened in my career very incrementally. And it was never... A, a, a decision that I'm going to go and be a war correspondent. I'd never wanted to do that. Um, it just happened. It just was an organic progression. So my advice is that if somebody wants to do that, they need to think very clear, carefully about their m motives. Um, and reality is, if they, if they don't have a very clear vision and talent and luck, they're not going to get there anyway. 
Uh, the answer is yes. I don't know what percentage of people. And that's in part why I showed you that little videotape. The woman clearly, uh, the trauma is over for her. When she says, it's over, you can ask me about it, but I'd rather show you pictures of my grandchild. That's, that person is, is cured. And certainly, I'm just wrecking my brain a little bit, but who are the great people in history we know who got very traumatized, who have done very well? The person who comes to mind is Nelson Mandela, uh, uh, who was a very traumatized guy and was a very violent guy. Uh, when I was involved in that process in South Africa, his original family still didn't want to talk to him because he was such a violent guy before he went off to Robben Island. And uh, he came back and truly came out a very, very mindful, peaceful, sweet man. Um, when asked about it, what made the difference for him, he says boxing. Boxing taught me how to really look at people carefully and be mindful and to check in with my body and to know how another person was going to do and how I should react. And he says the transformation was for that. That's not exactly what most people who get treatment for post-marriage stress are being taught that boxing would, may, might be very helpful for them. I always suspect that tango dancing might be very helpful. <laughs> because tango dancing reestablish your sense of rhythm and embodiment with another human being, something that gets lost in traumatized people. So you may have to look a little bit outside of your conventional mental health treatment mm -hmm. to actually find the answer to these questions. But do people recover? Yeah. And they always recover in the context of some deep spiritual experience and transformation. Okay, I can't, uh, I'll, I'll take you in just one second, but I have, um there's so many of us in this room who are uh, interested in and involved in uh, conflict resolution. Uh, many of us are in, in international conflicts. And as you all know, there are so many conflicts in this, intractable conflicts, that are still going on in, in the world. Obviously, the Middle East, for one. Um, and I, I just from a, from a trauma expert's point of view, how would you say that, would you say that the trauma that let's say the negotiators who are sitting at these negotiating tables trying to resolve these conflicts, what effect is the fact that you having lived in a, in a context that's been so traumatic for so long, what effect does that have on the people who are sitting down at a table trying to work these things out? And in the, well, unable to do so. You guys know much more about it than no, I do. No, no, I'm talking to you from, from, a trauma, <laughs> from a trauma point of view, though. What would you say? See, for me, having been involved in a situation like that, the hardest piece is something that I had a hard time taking in from my old teacher, Alvin Sembra, that I trained to become a psychiatrist. He's a very loving guy. He said, hate makes the world go wrong. And the hardest thing when you deal with these sort of issues is to see how much pleasure people get out of hating each other. And as a negotiator, I would find it most difficult. I used to do a lot of, I used to consult to the PLO on how to treat with torture victims and then skip over to Hadassah Medical School to work with my friends and colleagues there. And I just got totally desperate about the situation over there because people enjoyed hating each other so much. And so what do you do as a negotiator dealing with people who get pleasure out of whatever they're doing? That's a hard, hard thing for me. Yeah. And you guys think that reason will get you out of it. I gave up on that a long time ago. No, I want to follow on what you said, Donna, because I mean, I was just thinking, what's the activist agenda? What's the peacemaking activist agenda out of what you're saying? And it is to insert a trauma conversation in the public space, in the negotiating. I mean, you should be at Camp David, obviously, right? Or Donna should. No, I don't think so. Well, I mean, if we're not... I get too hijacked into these situations. I'm sorry? I get too hijacked into... Okay, so Donna yeah, should, then. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, if there's no conversation about trauma at the negotiating table, and there's no um, understanding that the lens that people bring to mediation, then we're not having the, the right conversation. See, what, what I've seen is that the only way you can come to some sort of position of reconciliation is by truly feeling the other person's pain. And so that's the issue. If you can truly feel the sorrow that another person is going through, 
and identify with it, people will come to peace. And that's really what trauma treatment in some ways is all about. Feeling all of your own pain and having, having compassion for yourself for having the pain that you have because people tend to despise themselves for their weakness and all they have gone through. What I went into in, on the West Bank, sadly, was I was in the West Bank quite active day before the Second Intifada, just before the guys came back from Tunis. And um, the younger generation was really beginning to move away from the confrontation. And the older people couldn't. And they would say, look what they have done to us. Look what they have done to us. And that, that, that became the next excuse to strike again. And so the issue of revenge and the pleasure of revenge is what you guys are up against, I think. How do, you, how do people get over wanting to take revenge and feeling the sorrow of the other side? That's a big job. Other Karam هذا الكلام صحيح إذا كان اللي صار بالماضي ضلوا بالماضي بس لما يصير يتكرر فالموضوع مش موضوع انتفاع موضوع إنه بتجدد الأحداث. This will be true if what happened in the past is stayed in the past but if it's a circle that keeps on going we can probably look at this as a as a true analysis of the situation because what happened in the past keep on repeating itself so we can live it we can look at it as a revenge. So right. But that's what he's saying. That's, that's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. 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 Well, I know this, we've run out of time. I knew this was going to happen. Uh, I'm really sorry for the people who wanted to ask questions and we are not able. But please join me in thanking Bessel van der Kopp and Stimbaard. <laughs>